Welcome back everybody. Um, well, we are going to talk about shoulder and shoulder complex. Uh, so as we go uh, through that PowerPoint, my eyes are going to follow the PowerPoint. So I'm going to look away a little bit from you uh, because I want to again keep myself organized and making sure that uh, I don't go uh, off topic too much. <laughs> So uh, let's go uh, to the uh, first slide, informational first slide. And I'm going to read what you can read with me. And I'm going to explain only what I feel like I have to explain. Things which are simple and should be taken really from the face value. There is not much to explain. I will tell you. Uh, and and we're gonna go forward so uh, the lecture hopefully is gonna go a little bit faster so evaluate uh, evolutionary changes freed men's upper extremity uh, and enabled a person uh, to do work basically prehension and functional use so in other words think about shoulder or sh shoulder complex as we're going to shortly learn uh, it's, it's really really very versatile joint or set of joints uh, enabling us to do what we do the way we do it a very similar joint but not identical it's our hip joint and clearly you can see that hip is a movable joint also uses three degrees of freedom but it's different you can't do with your lower extremities what you can do with your upper extremities um, so shoulder complex evolved to position the hand in space instability makes the shoulder complex continually subject to injury strain and a vari variety of diseases again it's always something for something if you have mobility there is less stability if you have a lot of stability you got less mobility if you have too much of of one thing you always pay, pay a price so this is our price to pay uh, um, you will uh, encounter um, a lot of patients and you perhaps did already uh, with shoulder problems um, so let's go to the next next slide we're going to talk about this shoulder in, in greater uh, depth so uh, three bones uh, which are involved in shoulder complex are scapula, clavicle, and humerus. And you really should know a basic anatomy of these bones or basic uh, uh, features of those bones for your own sake. Uh, if you are treating patients um, for shoulder problems, you really should know the basic anatomy. So let's go to next slide. And I'm not going to go through those slides. There is not much to explain. Uh, perhaps there is nothing to explain. All you need to do is open the book with good pictures. I presented some pictures, but perhaps they are too small. Uh, so, uh, so if you wish, uh, just open the anatomy, any anatomy book. Of course, nothing changes in anatomy. Um, and, and find those features. Just, just find them. Uh, just to make sure that you understand when the muscles are originating, when the muscles are inserting, and, and how the system of bones and muscles and ligaments uh, are, is actually working. Okay, so scapula, the most important parts are spine of the scapula, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, superior and inferior angles, vertebral border, lateral border, uh, so just make sure that you know where they are. Let's jump to another slide. Uh, some additional features, coracoid process, acromion process, uh, suprascapular notch, subscapular fossa, and glenoid fossa. Uh, some of those are going to be more important uh, than the others. Like For example, um, acromion process will become very important for us because uh, we will use acromion process as a point of reference uh, for for goniometry so we will learn exactly how to find a chromium process where it lies in your shoulder and 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 again this is a point of reference uh, we're gonna find the head of the humerus through finding a chromium process uh, um, so we know where to put the uh, place the fulcrum of the goniometer because the head of the humerus is is the 
axis of rotation for the shoulder. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And again, this is uh, just a picture. You can use different ones uh, to place all of those uh, features which is just mentioned just make sure that you understand uh, where where it where they can be found okay uh, so let's go to the next slide again there is not much to explain it's a it's a pure uh, anatomy you either know it or you don't there is no um, issues or, or, or no uh, subjects to really discuss it uh, clavicle uh, clavicle is this uh, little bone over here, very easily palpable. Uh, from uh, when you're looking from above, the uh, the clavicle, the shaft of the clavicle is kind of like in the S shape. And I'm looking at the picture right now. Uh, so this feature is very important because muscles are, are, are attached uh, to the clavicle, and as you can see, the medially is convex and the laterally is it's concave. Okay, so the medial end, the medial end, the closer to the uh, middle of the of the trunk, articulates with the sternum, and you can clearly see that on the on the top top uh, picture, the anterior view, uh, superior surface, right? Um, the inferior surface. Look at the picture closely. The inferior surface rests against the very first rib. So the very first rib is very, very hard to detect or palpate or closely to impossible because it's, it's deeper inside um, uh, your trunk, your torso. Mm. The lateral and uh, the lateral end uh, forms a cromioclavicular joint, a cromioclavicular joint, because uh, 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 again, a chromion process is the part of scapula. So your clavicle attaches to scapula in that very point. You can see it on the left-hand side. It's kind of dotted uh, circle. Uh, represents the acromioclavicular joint. So the medial side uh, forms sternoclavicular joint for obvious reason because uh, because clavicle attaches to sternum at this very point. Okay. What else I want you to know about that? That's basically, basically it for that particular uh, slide. So let's go further. The function, the function of the uh, clavicle. Uh, well, clavicle is a small bone, but it's very significant bone, uh, especially, of course, in relation to our shoulder girdle. So functions are hold scapula and humerus away from the body. Without this little tiny bone over here, of course, our shoulder would collapse inside. Provides uh, for muscle attachments. A lot of important muscles are attached to clavicle. Protects blood vessels and nerves. Assists in uh, maintaining the position of the shoulder complex, and enables the increased range of motion of glenohumeral joint. We're gonna talk about this in a couple of minutes, but just to let you know that anything you are doing with your shoulder always affects. Or, or is helped by a motion from the clavicle. Clavicle doesn't move significantly, doesn't move a lot, but it adds to the range of motion to the, uh, to the entire shoulder girdle or the, co the shoulder complex. Uh, without the clavicle, you would have range of motion limitations. And for those of you who ever broke your clavicle, you know how much painful it is to move your shoulder simply because you cannot move your shoulder and not move clavicle and if the clavicle is broken that's where you have that excessive pain okay so let's go to humerus and again pure anatomy not much to discuss not much to explain all you need to do open the book find those features for yourself so head of the humerus, greater and lesser tubercle, intratubercular groove, also known as the bicipital groove, medial and lateral epicondyles. Now, medial and lateral epicondyles are going to be more important for us than anything else, uh, uh, perhaps with, uh, with the exception of head of the humerus, which, which I mentioned we're going to use it as a 
point of reference or axis of rotation for the shoulder joint but we also gonna use uh, medial and lateral epicondyles for our coniometric purposes so make sure that you uh, are aware where they are uh, I won't give you pictures and ask you for those names on test so don't worry about that but I do want you to have this information for your own sake because when we do goniometry uh, we will go back to some of those features and it's just easier if you know where they are okay um, and you know and I know for a fact that you learned that probably on a couple of different of occasions when you get uh, anatomy and physiology course or during your OTA courses uh, but this is just a reminder refresher okay so let's go to the next uh, slide another drawing or a picture uh, which which you got anterior view and superior view of the shoulder girdle uh, especially on the humerus uh, in this particular drawing so you can appreciate uh, all the features I, I ask you to find okay so this is on you kind of homework so to speak there is not much I can tell you what, what, what you cannot find yourself so this is the entire shoulder complex okay so we have clearly four joints so when you're talking about the shoulder majority of people or people who don't know anatomy they do refer to the shoulder as a glenohumeral joint but in reality for us we have to know that glenohumeral joint is only one out of four which consist um, which which combined together is going to give us that shoulder complex or shoulder girdle so acromioclavicular joint which we already discussed um, it's it's where, where the clavicle joins to scapula then sternoclavicular joint is the medial portion when this uh, when the clavicle joint to sternum and then you have scapulothoracic joint which is not a through joint and I do have another slide so let's go to the next slide which explains this the scapulothoracic joint is not a through joint articulation but rather where the scapula moves over the thorax why is not a true joint because we know already that joints are really articulations between two bones or more but there is only one bone it's only scapula and the scapula is embedded in muscles uh, so that's why it's sometimes represented or called not a true joint but nevertheless it's considered a joint and it's a fourth joint of the entire shoulder complex and we cannot forget about that because scapula is extremely important with movement of our shoulder which we are going to discuss very shortly so the glenohumeral joint is where the head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula and let's go to the to the next slide okay so here it's a picture of drawing a sternoclavicular joint okay on the left side looks a little bit different than on the right side why is that well because on the left side you can see with ligaments and um, or, or the capsule the joint capsule it is a capsular joint uh, but on the right hand side that capsule was removed to show you deeper so you can clearly see that that the um, mandibulum of the sternum and your uh, medial portion of the clavicle they are not super tight they don't fit precisely so in order to increase the congruency of the bone the articular disc is there all right the fibrocartilages articular disc and you can nicely see on this picture is right there to increase the congruency of those bones so those bones can fit together nicely uh, and allowing for better movement okay uh, what else i would like you to know about the sternoclavicular joint this joint links axial skeleton with the appendicular skeleton all right axial skeleton with your appendicular uh, skeleton uh, of course the appendicular upper part of your upper the appendicular skeleton 
uh, kinematics of the joint, these joints are allowed to rate degrees of freedom, believe it or not. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the motions are not big, but they are present. Okay, so three degrees of free, uh, freedom, and of course, uh, that you, you, uh, those three degrees of freedom represent that you can move in three different planes, uh, and um, and utilize, of course, three axes of rotation. So, uh, what can you do? Well, you can do a lot actually. Those small but subtle movements. You can elevate. You can depress. This movement occurs in this uh, sternoclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joint, right here. Okay, I'm, I, I struggle a little bit with this camera here, um, but you get the point. Okay, um, also can protract and retract, protract and retract, and as we are raising our arm and bringing the arm down, it also can rotate, but rotate this way, on the longitudinal axis of rotation of the bone, meaning this way, okay? Longitudinal axis of rotation of the bone. So technically, we have those movements available and they are there. Uh, and uh, clavicles, uh, clavicle itself, like I mentioned before, uh, and, and the sternoclavicular joint helps <coughs> to adjust the, the, the movement to increase that, that final range of motion of our shoulder girdle, okay? Uh, and like I mentioned before, all functional movements of the shoulder involves the movement of the clavicle, involves the sternoclavicular joint. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Here we have a cromioclavicular joint. So, so this is where clavicle attaches to scapula, more precisely to the acromion process of the scapula. How does it attach through the acromioclavicular ligament, which you can observe right here on the drawing. So this acromioclavicular uh, ligament creates like a bondage, it creates roof, it's like a roof uh, over your uh, shoulder joint. And you can see the importance of the coracoid process we, uh, we mentioned, uh, one of those features of the scapula. Uh, for example, uh, one head of the biceps derives from the coracoid process, but also very important ligaments, uh, which you can see right here, coraco uh, cromial ligaments, for example, and other ligaments which are uh, stabilizing your shoulder. So coracoid process is one of those very important features of the scapula. Uh, so what else I would like you uh, to know? Just remember the, the, the uh, acronyms, acromioclavicular uh, joint would be AC joint. Sternoclavicular joint would be represented by SC joint. Okay, um, what else? Uh, also is three degrees of freedom. Three degrees of freedom. Uh, so uh, upward, downward um, rotation. So when you're doing upward, downward, rotation that's uh, acromioclavicular joint helps okay uh, but you can do you can utilize all three planes and therefore all three axis of rotations therefore you can do a lot with the joint uh, and again the joint doesn't give you a, a massive amount of range of motion but but nevertheless uh, it does. So, so if uh, if something is wrong with the ligaments or or joint itself, um, it's going to greatly limit your ability to to use your your arm. Okay. Uh, let's. I think this is m primarily all I need you to know. Let's go uh, to the next slide. Glenohumeral joint. Uh, glenohumeral joint or H, uh, GH joint is formed between the very large convex head of the humerus, as you can clearly see on the picture here. Well, it's not that clear because it's covered by uh, um, a lot of lines which represent the ligaments, but th there, it, there it is. Um, and the very shallow concavity of the glenoid fossa. Glenoid fossa is a part of the scapula, of course, 
but the glenoid fossa is shallow so what does this tell you that tells you that we have great mobility but stability is not there we are really prone for injuries and we're going to discuss this of course uh, in a couple of minutes uh, so uh, very important muscles which which go uh, through that space and uh, as you can see, clearly see on this picture, picture there is a chromioclavicular ligament, which we already discussed. There is another one, coraco, uh, a chromial ligament. And those two ligaments, it's like the, the top of your shoulder. And there is a space between, between that top or the roof of your shoulder and the head of the humerus. There is a space. Uh, the space is not large. It is, it's really not large, but a lot of features are going through that space and 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 this is a little bit unfortunate of course we have again something for something mobility for stability the more mobility the more injuries so there are four very important muscles going through that space it, uh, we call them collectively as rotator calf muscles right it's four muscles so it's a subscapularis supraspinatus infrast Pinatus and teres minor. All right, so those four uh, very important muscles which enables us to do a lot with our shoulder, uh, and they are collectively called rotator cuff. And you per uh, perhaps had already patients, or you will have uh, patients with uh, rotator cuff injuries. Those are common injuries because, again, because of the instability of the shoulder, uh, we are prone for those injuries. Okay, and I do believe uh, that pretty much covers all I need you to know about it, at least uh, for now. Um, remember that, the, that those bones, articulating surfaces of those bones are always covered with hyaline cartilage. Okay, it's a, it's a very thin layer of, uh, cartilage, uh, of the hyaline, hyaline cartilage, but it's important layer because uh, of course, it gives a great protection f uh, to the bones. Okay, uh, let's go through the ne to the next slide. Let's talk about the bursa. Think about the bursa as uh, a pillow, uh, usually filled with with a fluid. So we have many bursas in the shoulders. Uh, what do we have those bursas for? Uh, protection, mainly for protection. Uh, it's like a fat part, but the fat part is uh, it's made from fat, as the name suggests. Where the bursa, it, it, it's a it's a pillow filled with 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 the fluids. Um, so the most important bursa in the shoulder area are subdeltoid bursa and the subacromial bursa. But we have total of eight bursas. So I encourage you to actually I have a picture in the next slide right here and I encourage you go, uh, go uh, to go through that picture through those names it's from from the book and for example you got another um, bursa over here which is called when you look at the, 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 in the uh, bottom of that uh, drawing it's called axillary pouch that's another bursa and you can uh, very easily find that uh, right here it's like a like a softer part, uh, perhaps a little bit easier to squish part of the skin. Uh, so that would be your axillary pouch or one more of the bursas w which I just mentioned. Bursas are very important uh, because of the, uh, of the fact of protection, but we also can suffer from the condition known as bursitis, meaning we overusing our joints and we create inflammation of those bursas because they are filled with um, with fluids uh, they can actually inflame they can become much bigger they can swell it's a lot of pain in the worst case scenario if the um, therapy doesn't work patients must go through surgeries and sometimes the bursa needs to be removed because it's a chronic uh, inflammatory condition Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, uh, when you talk about shoulder girdle, you talk about four different joints. 
if you're talking about scapula you're talking really about only scapular joint so there are, might be some discrepancies in terminology which i think is important to understand so elevation is also called elevation that's what scapula does with the entire sh shoulder girdle depression that's what scapula does as well but when we're going into protraction the entire shoulder goes into protraction the scapula itself goes into abduction and you can appreciate this because here is the spine and the scapulas are here and they go into abduction as the shoulder girdle goes into protraction and as we retract or going back the scapulas are going I'm trying to find the camera again going back so they adduct and here is the spinal column okay so a little bit different terminology but but very similar okay let's go to the next slide and the, and this uh, very clearly shows you uh, what do we call uh, and how the scapula behave during elevation, abduction, adduction, and we have depression and downward rotation and abduction and upward rotation. Those when you are lifting your arm, abducting your entire shoulder, and then adducting your entire shoulder, the scapulas are going into this type of motion when you're going up and this type of motion when you're going down and that's of course called upward rotation and as you're bringing your uh, arms down it's gonna this way which is the uh, downward rotation as, as you can clearly see uh, i am still finding my way around this camera okay so let's go through the next slide and i encourage you to open your open your uh, uh, anatomy book again mm, and look at the brachial plexus okay uh, we have set of nerves coming uh, out of your neck area okay and um, so the nerves are uh, really named uh, from where they derived and the, the first portion are called roots and then trunks so um and then divisions and then the cords and then individual individual nerves which are actually innervating innervating um, the muscles so i encourage you to open the book and just follow the brachial plexus from the roots from from the origination from the roots all the way down and and i encourage you to look at the picture what's going on and when they become um, roots, when they become trunks, when they become divisions, when they become cords, and the, and and wh what's happening next, right? So and, and that, this is another uh, pure anatomy. So uh, all I uh, want you to do is, is open your book and 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 trace trace those nerves from the start to the end. And, and understand the concept of uh, brachial plexus okay so let's go to the next slide here I'm going to go relatively fast uh, because um, let's put it this way uh, on the test um, I'm not gonna ask you I'm not gonna give you those pictures and I'm not gonna ask you uh, which muscle is responsible for which movement however i did include this in the powerpoint because it's a very important part of of uh, an anatomical knowledge of the muscles and and what do they do and which muscle is responsible uh, for what movement so i gave you um, uh, many muscles uh, and and i tried to uh, bring the drawings or pictures of certain muscles um, so you can clearly see them and also i gave you descriptions or what they are primarily responsible for so please review it however uh, 
I did not um, in I won't I will not include that in the actual uh, test the multiple choice test but you will uh, have to know at least upper extremity muscles and all of them because as we are going to perform manual muscle testing we will palpate each primary mover so in other words uh, it, it, it's it's um, part of that face-to-face uh, -face or hands-on examination later on during the sixth week uh, um, or weekend uh, six, uh, sixth week uh, when when you are going to be responsible to show me back how to perform manual muscle testing okay and uh, scapula elevation and uh, another uh, pictures uh, another picture of muscles so you can clearly see that uh, a lot of picture uh, I'm sorry a lot of muscles are responsible for the scapular elevation and just look at those red arrows I'm looking at them right now and what do they represent they represent the action of those muscles and since many muscles are working together as a unit and they're pulling in approximately the same direction we're gonna call it of course synergistic muscles synergistic mov movement when muscles are pulling approximately in the same direction to accomplish one motion or the same motion uh, and next uh, slide is middle trapezius lower trapezius serratus anterior uh, mass uh, serratus anterior and this is just a drawing showing you how that muscle works during protraction rhomboids, uh, scapula adductors and retractors, which muscles are uh, working and how do they do that, scapular depressors, shoulder flexors, shoulder extensors, shoulder abductors, external rotators, internal rotators, shoulder adductors, shoulder horizontal abductors shoulder horizontal adductors and and that's it so just take a look at the, the those muscles make sure that you at least uh, understand uh, where they originate where they insert what do they do um, and we will come back to not to all of those muscles but to the primary movers of upper extremity shoulder elbow forearm wrist and digits when we are actually doing the uh, manual muscle testings or evaluations of strength okay having said that uh, i am right now looking at the uh, powerpoint which says scapulohumeral rhythm so first I'm going to read the information which I posted or placed on that slide and then I'm going to shortly discuss uh, what is this all about. So for every 15 degrees of elevation, flexion or abduction. So let me tr try to find that camera over here. So either I do shoulder flexion or abduction this idea works all right so for uh, this is a two to one ratio in a full overhead elevation of the arm and I put 180 degrees uh, for the easiness of calculation okay your patient doesn't have to be 180 could be 160 170 but for easiness of calculation I put 180 so 60 degrees of that motion is from upward rotation of the scapula when 20, 120 degrees from the glenohumeral motion. So is this 2 to 1 ratio? Yes, it is. 120 to 60. 2 to 1 ratio. But let's go to the next slide. There we go. It's a, a drawing of right shoulder which is elevated and we can say if that person 
uh, on that drawing uh, flex the shoulder or abducted the shoulder. We can't say it, we didn't see the movement, it's a, it's a still drawing, but it is elevated to full 180 degrees. So here we can clearly see that 120 degrees comes from glenohumeral joint. Uh, in this case, authors of the book put abduction, so we can assume that that, that person uh, did abduction, but again, if that was a shoulder flexion, uh, the result would be the same. So 120 degrees comes from the glenohumeral joint abduction, when 60 degrees comes from the scapulothoracic joint upward rotation. So we have this 2 to 1 ratio. Now, where did the 60 degrees came from? As you can clearly see that the SC joint gave 30 degrees and AC joint gave another 30 degrees for the total of 60 degrees. So although we can say, well, scapula gives 60 uh, degrees of that uh, motion, however, that's the importance of your clavicle and that's the importance of the SC and AC joints because really the movement occurs in those joints. Okay, so now why this is important? Because I have personally seen therapists lifting passively a patient's shoulder above the head or even above 90 degrees when the patient was paralyzed, when the patient muscles didn't work. So you can only imagine, especially above 90 degrees, like the 90 degrees is semi-safe, semi-safe. Not fully though, but okay, let's go with that. But everything above 90 degrees becomes really damaging or it could end up damaging muscles or joint itself. People who uh, cannot move themselves and you have to do that movement 100% passively, you have to, with your hand, you have to grab the scapula from behind, but grab the scapula firmly. And as you're raising, as you're raising somebody's arm up, the scapula must follow. If you don't do this motion of the scapula, if you just lift somebody's arm up, those muscles don't work. Therefore, you can damage, uh, damage the joints. Uh, a scapula and humerus is two to one ratio. So approximately for two degrees of humeral motion, you have to follow with scapula one degree, right? It's, it's not, doesn't have to be super precise. You're gonna feel it as you, as you, as you mobilize the patient. You're gonna feel that the scapula needs to go up. Because if it doesn't, and why doesn't? Because the muscles are paralyzed. The muscles are paralyzed. So you separating, by doing passive range of motion of the shoulder without mobilization of the scapula, you separating humerus from the scapula. And that's where the danger lies, okay? That's where you can damage the muscle, you can rip the muscles, but you can also damage the ligaments, tendons, and other structures, really. Lying like like blood supply or nerves uh, within the shoulder. Okay, very important concept for us as therapists. Let's go to the next uh, next slide. Okay, um, when the arm is fully elevated overhead, we know that the arm was externally rotated to move the greater tubercle out of the humerus out of the way of the acromion process as the arm was elevated. Okay, uh, if the arm is internally rotated, only about 90 to 100 degrees of shoulder abduction can be obtained. Let's do this together. And I will find, try to find this camera over here. Okay, the other side. Okay, here. So let's, let's 
internally rotate our shoulder like this like this internally rotate put it to your side now so so the pinky is outside and the thumb is inside and now try to abduct the shoulder as high as you can well for me this is it so for me personally 90 degrees maybe 95 but this is already painful let's bring it down now let's put your arm from internal to external rotation just like this put it back and now abduct your shoulder it goes easily all the way up easily all the way up so please do it yourself uh, so that clearly tells us that if we don't know anatomy we shouldn't touch patients all right uh, because if you are doing the passive range of motion and you do, don't mobilize the scapula that's the mistake number one now if you don't pay attention to internal or external rotation of the shoulder and you are doing passive abduction adduction to the shoulder let's say cva patient or you know uh, list of diagnosis could be long right but but um, for easiness of discussion i'm gonna utilize that uh, concept of cva what's gonna happen you can actually do more damage than good okay that's why it's so important to understand those concepts okay let's go to uh, the next slide here we got uh uh, arthrokinematics of the glenohumeral joint and you can see it uh, f uh, from the superior uh, superior aspect and on the right hand side is anterior aspect anterior aspect so uh, what's going on over there and why this is important to discuss well as you can see a few muscles are working as a unit and and uh, the end result is one movement on the left hand side you got internal rotation on the right hand side you got abduction so why this is important why we talk about that well because it's a synergy but it's very special kind of synergy we talk about it right so in this case we can we can go further and and it's get special name we're gonna call it kinetic arc uh, kinetic from the movement and why arc because you can clearly see that those muscles are pulling in all different directions but when put it together uh, yeah, they, they produce one movement it's kind of like a force couple but it's taken into even different level okay kinetic arc and uh, and uh, the next um, the next slide shows you the kinetic arc as well during uh, upward rotation of the scapula and glenohumeral abduction okay uh, same concept let's go further same concept downward rotation of the scapula and glenohumeral adduction many muscles pulling in all different directions producing one motion kinetic arc so it's a special type of synergistic movement of the muscles let's go further okay we talk about those uh, those um, mobility for stability and if you have too much mobility it's gonna cost us right so so let's talk about uh, some of those issues rotator cuff injuries um, we already mentioned a little bit about the rotator cuffs we know the four different muscles which together are um, giving us that uh, umbrella name uh, rotator cuff right so supraspinatus although not the primary rotator it is used perhaps more than any other muscle in the shoulder complex adds a lot to glenohumeral stability it's subject to wear and tear due to the high forces it takes actually it was calculated on average of course stereotypically everybody is a little bit different uh, but the internal moment arm internal moment arm which we know what it is right now it's from the axis of rotation or the center of the joint uh, to the tendon of the muscle 
uh, it's in supraspinatus is about one inch on average one inch uh, and if the arm it's let's say again stereotypically speaking or we just assume you know that, that the, the arm length is 20 inches of course could be shorter or longer 20 inches we have um, and, and, and we hold something in our hand, right? Uh, we hold something heavy in our hand, or not heavy, anything in our hand. The, the mechanical advantage, which we sh uh, talked about that in previous uh, videos, is very, very small. It's actually 1 to 20, right? So imagine that you're holding something in your hand, and you hold your hand in front of you which is the worst case scenario of course we know by now because the resistance is the farthest from the center or from the the center of rotation of the joint uh, so so this is the worst case scenario so the muscle needs to work 20 times more than the resistance so let's say you're holding only one pound in your hand supraspinatus have to put out 20 pounds of force in order to just contradict uh, that uh, one pound so now take into consideration 10 pounds 15 pounds multiply this by 20 that's how much we abuse our supraspinatus so also it's not the primary mover it gets a lot of heat okay uh, okay what else can i tell you uh, so rotator cuff syndrome is a partial tendon tears, capsular adhesions when we are dehydrated, of course internally dehydrated, inflammation, bursitis, there is a lot of pain going on with that, uh, which is going to cause, of course, generalized weakness of the shoulder, and in severe cases become a frozen shoulder. I had uh, several patients with sh frozen shoulder, and they literally can't move not even half an inch because um, apparently they neglected the condition and the condition get worse and worse and worse without appropriate therapy the condition gets only worse sometimes it's so bad that the surgery is needed right so so, so this has to be surgically fixed and then you are going to see that patient uh, after the surgery or post surgically okay so uh, let's go to the an another slide uh, so frozen shoulder I, I just I just explained it so depending on the severity of the rotator cuff syndrome the arthrokinematics of the glenohumeral joint may be completely dis disrupted and and the shoulder become immobile Adhesive capsulitis, this is adhesions in inferior folds of the glenohumeral joint capsule. And again, uh, adhe adhesions are for different reasons. There could be dehydration inside, uh, could be lack of those fluids needed in the, in the, in the joint itself. It could be uh, internal swelling because of the overuse, uh, could be due to bursitis, etc., etc. Uh, and of course the severe pain will limit range of motion and strength and and therefore participation in all, all activities scapular winging my mom suffers from that uh, condition since a child but of course right now she's uh, older lady and that was long time ago in poland so uh, nobody could really fix that and even now not all uh, the conditions could be fixed right <coughs> so scapular winging comes from the weakness of the serratus anterior so i encourage you to go back with uh, with in this presentation back in slides and find the anterior serratus, serratus anterior and look where the serratus anterior is positioned and and how does it work where does it pull right so the winging is bigger when the resistance is applied. So the more um, weight you try to lift, the winging increases. And of course, the farther away from the central of the body or the, or the midline, the winging increases as well. Uh, so serratus anterior uh, should, uh, should normally 
upward re rotate the scapula, but it's too weak to do it. It doesn't do that upward rotation of the scapula. So the deltoid muscles cause the scapula to downwardly rotate. Okay, and and a person with the uh, winged scapula um, has a very hard time. Sometimes it's impossible to raise arm above 90 degrees. That 90 degrees is kind of like a magic number, but 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 up to 90 degrees could be weaker, but possible above 90 degrees is is, is sometimes sometimes even impossible okay so let's go to the next slide uh, this is a very very important concept so i'm gonna spend a little bit of time on subluxation and dislocations why did i place only anterior dislocation well because it's the most common the other subluxation uh, i'm sorry dislocation like posterior dislocation on lateral dislocation are rare or much much rarer so the chances are that you are going to encounter anterior dislocation more often than anything else but it's a it's a it's a big difference between dislocation and subluxation uh, so subluxation paralyzed muscles cause glenoid fossa to downward rotate humerus therefore slides down and gravity adds to all of these problems and this condition is a very common, for example, again, I'm coming back to the uh, hemoplegic uh, patients, CVA, CVA patients, right? So once the one side of the body is paralyzed, the muscles don't work. Uh, again, mobility for stability. We have a lot of mobility in our shoulder. We suffer from, from uh, muscular weakness, right? So let's go to the next slide, and here it's the, the uh, subluxation. So what can you see? This rope represents muscle, okay? The rope represents muscle. So on the left-hand side is an A, so that's our, that is going to be your normal. What can you see? The scapula, it's actually winked this way, winked upwards. The muscles are holding scapula slightly winked upward. This is the bone and this is the head of the humerus. So the head of the humerus goes into the scapula and scapula is, is able to sustain some weight of the humerus because of that inclination right here. Right? In addition, you can see uh, on the scapula, you can see a little bumps on that picture. Um, these bumps are cartilages bumps, uh, cartilages bumps which also uh, are going to uh, increase the congruity between the humerus and scapula. Okay, uh, so um, what else I wanted to uh, to explain over here? Um, those bumps really uh, have a name and the name is glenoid labrum okay uh, what's gonna happen when the muscles stop working and look at the picture b when you have this rope broken that represents m not working muscle the scapula itself when it was able to hold that bones pretty nicely like this right now the muscles don't work so the scapula is going to turn right it's going to turn the gravity doesn't help what the gravity does is pulling the pulling the humerus down and what's gonna happen to the labrum is gonna tear right so all of this together and you have subluxation meaning you can actually feel the distance between this uh, glenoid fossa and the head of the humerus you are actually you're not gonna see it as much because of the skin but you will feel through palpation i had many patients with this problem with subluxation problem however one was worse than any other i have seen it i could actually place four digits four of my digits between between 
uh, the scapula and the head of the humerus. My four digits simply went in, right? Uh, so th that was that was a very very bad situation. The patient was was paralyzed on one side. That was a CVA patient. Uh, the first thing what I did was order special equipment, which you can buy it, and as an OTR, you will be able to properly assess it, find that equipment in the in the catalog, order it, and issue to the patient. Uh, the device which actually was able uh, was bringing that uh, humerus up, holding it tightly into the uh, the uh, the with scapula and patient. Uh, wasn't suffering from the discomfort and really the discomfort comes with a lot of pain okay let's go to the next slide these locations are different this these locations are usually due to either sport related injuries or accidents force if you throw the ball extremely hard and your shoulder is um, somehow weak you can actually physically dislocate, um, dislocate anteriorly dislocate, dislocate uh, the shoulder. Uh, so you can see pictures here of elbow, foot, and shoulder, and 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 how those dislocations look like. You have uh, some pictures, and you also have um, X-rays. So take a look at that uh, dislocations of course are completely different than subluxations. This is not a matter of uh, muscular weakness. This is a matter of physical, physically pushing bones apart, right? So like I just mentioned, primarily occupational accidents, uh, motorcycle, car accidents, sport injuries, etc. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, impingement syndrome mechanism varies. Somehow sub subacromion space narrows or abnormal scapulothoracic rhythm develops. Uh, pain on a superior aspect uh, of shoulder beginning in mid-range of elevation. Again, that's kind of 90 degrees what we discussed. And increasing with continued flexion or abduction. Of course, everything above 90 degrees. Now imagine that you got limited space over here between the roof those ligaments we discussed and the head of the humerus and and muscles and blood supply and nerves are all coming through this limited space so of course you can put your fingers on your own shoulder and raise your shoulder just like i'm doing right now you will feel the tension rises the higher you go with the shoulder the tension is is greater as you reach the 90 degrees you can feel that it's fairly tight over here now go even higher and becomes hard like a stone that's because you compressing everything with the movement with either flexion or abduction okay so if if there are abnormalities you can squish you can squish your nerves you can you can squish your muscles and of course uh, with age comes arthritis and that doesn't help your your joints either tendonitis is inflammation of the tendons that usually is because of the overuse of muscles i believe this is the last slide even with the complete loss of glenohumeral motion the other joints will provide for some shoulder motion except for rotation so other muscles and joints kick in and kind of help you they cheat but rotation if you lose rotation that's it nothing else can rotate uh, your shoulder in the latter case the scapula will tilt forward to substitute so again you will have the substituting um, motion but you can clearly see it that somebody is not doing this but everything else start to work to accomplish that movement or accomplish that activity to finish the activity without the right movements okay that's uh, good enough for this presentation i hope you enjoy it i hope you learned uh, you learned something and i see you next time bye